Now the tribe of Joseph, I'm sure that many of you will be very excited to hear about it because brethren, it does concern personally <laughs> most of you because Joseph, as you probably know, is the British Commonwealth and the United States. Now in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, God tells Abraham, I'll make of thee a great nation and I'll bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I'll bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Well, brethren, this means that from Abraham came the seed, or Christ, who died for the world's sins, so that the world can live. But in addition to this meaning, we also know that Abraham's children made almost every discovery and thought up almost every invention that has improved man's condition and lot on earth. Whether people like to hear that or not, that is the truth. Now these white nations have been very generous with food and have distributed Bibles and helped with disaster relief and medical care worldwide. Well, this was exactly a birthright promise to Abraham's race. Now the Jewish people, you know, the Jews are an insignificant nation. They're not a great nation. An insignificant in terms of, you know, greatness. They're not really all that powerful as Ephraim and Manasseh are. In Genesis chapter 22, verses 17 and 18, we read also that it says, In blessing I'll bless thee, and in multiplying I'll multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate, it says the old King James, in Fenton it says the gates, and in various translations it says the gates, they shall possess the gates of the of his enemies. Now, the same, uh, this possessing gates of their enemies, when Rachel was being blessed by her brothers, they actually said, May thy seed possess the gates of their enemies. Now, in blessing, I'll bless thee and multiply, multiply the seas as the stars of heaven. In Genesis chapter 24, verse 60, you'll find translation as thousands of millions. So thousands of millions. As I told you many times, brethren, yes, there are Israelites who gather together in certain geographic locations because in these end times, in these last days, they have to be fulfilling the prophecies of Genesis 49, the prophecies of their dying father Jacob, and they also have to be fulfilling prophecies of Deuteronomy 33, the prophecies of Moses. However, there are many Israelites scattered all over the world, everywhere, Amos 9 and 9, keep that in mind. I'll sift the house of Israel you know, into the nations. So there are plenty of Israelites all over the place, brethren. We don't even know how many, but yeah, we know that at least there are the stars, like stars of heaven, thousands of millions. As the sand which is upon the seashore, Hosea chapter 1 verse 10 has that motif as well. And they shall possess the gates of their enemies. Now notice again that this was a birthright promise to Abraham's race. All right, this is about race. It has nothing to do, it was unconditional. There was no condition attached. You know, it is promised by race, by the origin. Because Abraham actually means father of a great multitude, and Sarah means princess. Yet, you know, the Jews today are comparatively few in number, and have no royalty in the state of Israel. They do not possess the gate, the gates of their enemies. You know, I, I'm sure they would. They wish they would possess the gates of their enemies, but they don't. And in fact, the worldwide population of Jews stands at 14.7 million, still falling short of the pre-World War II numbers, according to Israel's Center Bureau of Statistics. The numbers are currently, you know, to the end of 2018, and world Jewry reached a population of 16.6 .6 million right before the start of the Second World War in 1939. Israel has got 6.7 million Jews, which is 45% uh, of the world total. The United States has the second largest Jewish population with 5.7 million, followed by France at about 450,000, and Canada at some 392,000. Next is the United Kingdom, 292,000. Argentina, 180,000. Russia, 165,000. Germany, 118,000. And Australia, 116,000. So, in any case, the point is, you know, the Jewish people, these prophecies in Genesis 22, do not refer to the Jewish people because we know exactly who they are, where they are, and we know exactly what their numbers are. So therefore, these prophecies obviously refer to Joseph, to Ephraim and to Manasseh, Joseph's sons or their descendants. Considering all of this, let's just read, we can read Genesis chapter 17 and verse 15 and 16. 
Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I'll bless her and also give you a son by her. And I'll bless her and she shall be a mother of nations, in plural. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Again, in plural. plural. And I mentioned this to you, as you probably know, all the European royal families are basically uh, related one to another. So this was also part of the, you know, birthright blessings. Now, in Genesis 27, verse 28 and 29, Isaac transfers this Abrahamic birthright to Joseph, not to the firstborn Esau, his son Esau, to the Joseph, by saying, God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Curse be everyone that curses thee and blessed be he that blesses thee. And why is this? Well, because in Exodus 4, 22, it says, Thus says the Lord, Israel, that is Jacob, is my son, even my firstborn. But brethren, the Jews are a relatively poor nation today. Well, during the 80s, for example, the inflation rate exceeded 100% yearly. Believe it or not. Neither people nor nations nor even Judah's brethren serve him. Instead, you know, the Turks, which is the Esau, and Arabs, Ishmaelites, which are some of Jacob's brethren, are out to destroy the Jews. So, again, all these prophecies we're reading cannot be referring to the Jewish people, as you are going to, you know, hear that from various messianic circles. Yes, we love the Jewish people, of course, they are our brethren, certainly, but, you know, we have to understand what the Bible says. These prophecies about the domination of the world, possessing the gates of the enemies, this birthright and all this material wealth, indeed does apply to Britain and America and not to the Jewish people. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 14, God said to Jacob, Thou shalt spread abroad, and this was a prophecy, brethren, mark this very well, Thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south. And that is exactly how the house of Israel was being scattered from the promised land. First it went to the west, then to the east, to the north, and to the south. And this was again another birthright race promise made unconditional because Abraham obeyed God. In Genesis chapter 35, and if you notice we're quoting from Genesis from the very first book of the Bible. And as I told you many times, the, wor the world history, the entire world history, or at least the most important events of the world history are recorded in the first five books of Moses. It is amazing how that aspect of the Bible truth is being overlooked by many people, brethren. So we're reading about the prophecies from the very first book of the Bible related to our times, our late, late latter days. Genesis 35 verse 11, God says to Jacob, a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. We do understand that. One nation, one nation under God, the United States, and a company or commonwealth of nations, of course, are the uh, commonwealth of British Commonwealth, which is uh, the greatest empire ever in the history of humankind. So this, you know, a nation, a company of nations, that this is another birthright race promise with no conditions attached. Meaning, you know, God didn't say if, you know, your descendants will be godly and faithful to me, then I will uh, make uh, of them a nation and a company of nations. No, this is not, there are no conditions attached. Now, the Jewish people have never been a company of nations and only recently, only recently, I mean in the 20th century, they even recently became one nation. So this company of nations obviously cannot refer to the Jewish people, and even this one nation, and one stronger nation, the strongest in the world, does not refer to them. The Jews have for the most of their history been a scattered people. I just read to you the statistics. You know, most of the Jewish people, so 45% of the Jewish people do live in the state of Israel today, but it means that, that the majority of the Jewish people do not live in Israel, in the state of Israel today. They're scattered all over the place. Yeah, I just you know, enumerated the most important numbers in the Jewish community in Europe and in the United States, and there are Jews, of course, everywhere. Now, from Jacob, we find that the unconditional birthright, race promise, was transferred to Joseph, not to Judah. It was transferred to Joseph because, as we read before, First Chronicles 5 and verse 2, it states, the birthright was Joseph's clear as clear as it can be. Joseph's not Judas. 
Now, brethren Joseph, as you know, had two sons. They are mentioned in Genesis 41, Manasseh and Ephraim. In that order, Manasseh was the older one and Ephraim was the younger one. And in Genesis chapter 48, verses 16 through 19, we have something, again, of prophetic significance. Jacob, his name literally means supplanter, and his name was changed to Israel, which literally means ruling with God. And you find a change in Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. In Genesis 48, verse 16 through 19, he said about those two sons of Joseph, Let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And then in this passage, he speaks about Manasseh. He says, And he, Manasseh, shall become a people, and he also shall be great. Indeed, we have to talk about make that people great again. And as I told you many times, in the coming kingdom of God, yes, we'll make that people great again. But they'll not be called Americans. They'll finally know their own identity, and they'll be called the tribe of Manasseh. But truly, Jacob continues, or Israel continues, his younger brother, which is Ephraim, shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations, or a group of nations, or a company of nations. So what happened was that, as I explained to you before, Jacob, basically, in Genesis 48, at his deathbed, he adopted these two sons as his own, and they became the nation and company of nations, destined unconditionally for national greatness. Mark what I said, Brendan, destined unconditionally Meaning that it was there was no condition attached, like if they would be godly, faithful, keeping God's commandments or whatever. No, it was unconditionally attached. They were destined to become the greatest nations upon the earth. And that is exactly what happened. Now, you have some other people, you know, like Brahmins in India, who are not Israelites, and also Saxons. They took the names, they're Saxons in Germany, of course, they took the names of Abraham and Isaac nationally, but also individually we find many Jacobsons, or variants thereof. Now, in Isaac shall thy seed be called, you find that in three scriptures, in Romans 9, 7, in Amos 7, 9, and 16, and in Genesis chapter 21 and 12. In Isaac shall thy seed be blessed. The Jews have never called themselves by the name Isaac. The Anglo-Saxons did, but the Jews never. They have their name after their father, Judah. Now, furthermore, this unconditional national birthright promise to Joseph's racial descendants, which are America and Canada and Australia, New Zealand and Great Britain. So this unconditional national birthright promise to Joseph's racial descendants is spelled out in greater detail in Genesis 49, verse 22 to 26. That's exactly what their father, Jacob, prophesied of them in this last days in these latter days and this is a prophecy brethren for the last days genesis 49 1 1 that's what jacob before he uttered those prophecies he said to all of his sons i'm going to tell you what will be of you in the latter days in the last days by logic brethren by common sense we then understand that those prophecies were not fulfilled anciently before christ on those 12 sons because the latter days are now in which we are living now which means that the descendants of those 12 tribes, including the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh today, are the ones fulfilling these prophecies. So here is a prophecy, Genesis 49, verse 22, about Joseph in general. Now keep in mind, Joseph is divided now into two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. So Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him, and shot at him. Now his branches run over the wall, brethren, they're colonizing people. The archers have shot, uh, have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. And that's the case even today. But his bow abode in strength, well, because obviously God gave him that strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Yeah, the famous stone, Leah filed, the stone of scone. Even by God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies under, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph, 
and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Joseph was special, was separate. And yet, brethren, yes, God bless America indeed. We have just read tremendous blessings of America today. And clearly the nations composed of Joseph's descendants, as I said, will be colonizing powers whose people, as we have just read, run over the wall, over the wall of national boundaries. Joseph's descendants will be involved, as we see, in wars, and they'll be shot at and hated. But their big military power is strong because God has blessed these nations of Joseph with great wealth, brethren. Now notice also that the stone of Israel is located in Joseph. It's not located in Judah, but in Joseph. And yes, we know it is located there, the Stone of Scone. It is in Great Britain. It was under the throne of, uh, of the British monarch. Nowadays, it's being kept in Scotland as a part of Scottish identi identity. And nevertheless, with the, of course, the clause, the clause is that any time that there will be a coronation ceremony in London, that the Stone of Scone will be transported to London and be placed under the throne, under the uh, chair of the British monarch. So, you know, the stone of Israel is located in Joseph. So Jacob must have given that stone, not to Judah, but to Joseph. And once upon a time in the uh, Westminster Abbey, when that, when that uh, stone was being placed there, there was a notification next to it. The stone of Jacob. The pillow stone of Jacob. The pillar of Jacob. Uh, as far as I know, that notification is not there anymore. So obviously people are trying to, many people are trying to downplay the biblical truth, but yet the truth stands out and British and Americans cannot deny it. British and Americans may think that they are just like any other nation upon the face of the earth, but that doesn't make any sense, brethren. From the standpoint of all of us, the rest of the world, the rest of us, it doesn't make any sense because if you are just like any other people, then you will be as poor and impoverished as many other people. Then you will be having all sorts of troubles with many other people. You'll have even worse red tape bureaucracies that many of us have to deal with every day in and day out. And everything will be as at least twice as difficult. Life will be as at least as twice as difficult and more complicated in your lands than as it is in our countries where we live. No, Britain and America are not like any other people. They are not Gentiles. Because all this dominance over the world and this unprecedented material wealth certainly is not there by a chance. If Britain and America were just like any other people, then Britain and America would be, as I said, impoverished and totally impoverished. They would not be as mighty. They would not be as influential. They would not be colonizing people. So we can, since the stone of Israel... Obviously, Jacob must have given it to Joseph. We can therefore expect to find a stone of scone in one of Joseph's nations used for the coronation purposes. Indeed, we spoke about that when we talked about uh, Judah's scepter. Because, as you know, the British royal family is descendant, direct descendant of Judah, of Judah's son Faris. And thankfully, even that is still present on the internet. So you can just Google out, you know, if you, if you type, for example, genealogy of Queen Elizabeth II, you'll find her genealogy there on the internet. So that much is still out there. I don't know how, man, many, how much more it will be out there, but we need to be aware of all that. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, it is the uh, prophecy of Moses. From verse 13 to 16, we find the promises of blessing you know, the promises of blessing repeated. And then, after they're repeated, then Moses adds in verse 17, Deuteronomy 33, he says, His glory is like the firstlings of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Now again, brethren, we see exactly the colonizing nature of Joseph's descendants who pushed the people together to the ends of the earth. Indeed, what is Australia? Well, it's an isolated continent. It's the end of the world. What is New Zealand? A blissful, wonderful island, but it is at the end of the earth. Well, isn't Canada, in a sense, the northern utmost peak of the world? Indeed. The Isles, what are the British Isles? They're basically the end of the European continent. So yes, to the ends of the earth. And more, more, more importantly, we see that Manasseh and Ephraim are connected with a fruitful bow and archers shooting arrows and unicorns. Interesting, unicorns. Now Manasseh was the 13th tribe 
keep that in mind brethren because why because joseph was the 11th son of jacob and benjamin was 12. and ephraim succeeded joseph in the 11th position since he was reckoned as the firstborn not manasseh but ephraim so he uh he uh succeeded joseph in the 11th position thus manasseh was 13th now you may ask well then how come that we always have these 12 tribes of israel 12 well very simply the tribe of Levi, as you might remember, never got any allotment of the land in the promised land. The tribe of Levi was scattered into all the tribes because they were performing their priestly duties. And therefore, they had no land of their own, but each, but other tribes. So, of course, God made it that way so that, you know, there will still be 12 tribes. But technically speaking, yes, Manasseh is 13th tribe. Now, why is this important and why is this interesting? Because you'll see in a minute, the number 13 is so involved in the in america both american history and american herald, heraldry that is just uh, undisputable proof of who americans today are they are the tribe of manasseh also we know from numbers number chapter two uh, there is a record about the four sides of israel's camp it's in numbers chapter two and then he speaks about the banners in verse 3 10 18 and 25 which no doubt were a type of God's throne room in heaven, which is described in Exodus 1.10 and in Revelation 4.7, where, where, when John in vision sees God's throne. Now, again, you know, do you realize what I said? Israel's camp was arranged in the way of God's throne room in heaven. That's how important Israel is to God, brethren. That's how important, again, is this pivotal truth of Israel. And all those who do away with that truth and all those who are giving up on that truth and all those who are labeled that truth as racist or whatever, all those people are deceived, brethren. Because God's eyes are always upon his people, Israel. That's another reason why, as I mentioned many times, American Britain will go undergo the worst national punishment ever. Because God bestowed upon them the richest material blessings. And yet, what, what British, modern-day Britain and America are doing with those blessings, you all see in your lands. I don't have to elaborate on that. And therefore, God is going now to punish those nations more than any other. It is a corrective punishment. It's not for the sake that God is sadistic and he wants to punish Britain and America in a sadistic way. He wants to do it because only when he strips Britain and America of all that material wealth, only then Britain and America will realize that the only thing that really is truly valuable that remains is relationship with God. And then they will, whatever remains of them in the Great Tribulation, will turn to God, turn to their God. And I'm sure in the Great Tribulation, again due to the activity of the two witnesses, Britain and America will realize their identity, brethren. The, the issue of identity is so important. Because if we don't understand the identity of the 12 tribes of Israel, we will certainly not understand the Bible and the Bible prophecies. I've been telling you this time and time again. And as we are going through each one of these, you see, Old Testament scriptures, I'm hoping, my hope is that you realize that it is really true. If we do not understand, and if we do not accept the identity of Israel, modern day Israel, we will not understand all these prophecies. How will we understand the prophecies how will we understand the modern day condition in britain and america no way so anyway you know there were standards in the camp on the fourth sides of israel's camp they're all mentioned in uh, numbers chapter two and then you'll find there that we know that judah's east side had the lion and of course the judah lion is connected with judah in the uh, prophecy about judah in genesis 49 verse 9 also, with, the, with that starting point, we know that Reuben's south side had the firstborn men. And in fact, when we, next time we'll be speaking about Reubenites, in Deuteronomy 33, verse 6, you'll find that Moses connects Reuben with men also. And also we have Ephraim's west side, which had the bullock. We have just read in Deuteronomy 33, verse 17, you know, bullock. And then the north side was Dan's north side, had the eagle. And I'm sure you remember, when I say eagle, I'm sure you remember Revelation 4, 7 and Exodus chapter 1, verse 10. It had to be eagle since that is all that is left, you know. And Israel is, as you remember, taken to safety on eagle's wings. 
Exodus 19, 4. And we always traditionally use that to apply. And we read in Revelation 12, 14 about the fleeing to the place of safety will be on eagle's wings. But we also find that Balaam compared Israel to a unicorn. That's in Numbers 23, verse 22. And he also in Numbers 24, verse 8 and 9, because he was forced by God not to curse but to bless Israel, he also compared Israel to a unicorn, a lion, and he also talked about Israel's arrows. Now, interestingly enough, unicorn and a lion, they're found on British coat of arms. As far as arrows, you may wonder, where, where do we find arrows? Well, remember the Great Seal of the United States. You find arrows there. Now, interesting enough, Balaam's prophecy, Numbers 23, verse 9 and 10, Balaam's prophecy says the following. The people, the people of Israel, of course, shall dwell along and shall not be reckoned among the nations, you see. Again, as I told you, brethren, Britain and America cannot be like any other nations. Oh, yes, they have the same human nature like any other nations, but they're not Gentiles. I'm talking about the origin, not about the human condition, fallen human condition. The origin of Britain and America, they're not Gentiles. They are God's people, Israel, just like people of Northwest Europe are. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. This is the, uh, <laughs> the occultist Balaam blessing Israel. And then in Numbers 23, verse 22 through 24, says he has, as it were, the strength of, a, of an unicorn. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. And then he continues in this prophecy. Numbers 24, verse 5 through 9. I'm going to read that portion now with you. How goodly are thy tents of Jacob and thy tabernacles of Israel, like the valleys are they spread forth, like gardens by the river's side, like the trees of lime aloes with which the Eternal has planted, and like cedar trees besides the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. You may remember also, brethren, in Revelation 17.5, it speaks about peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down like a lion and like a great lion. Who shall stir him up? Blessed he who blesses thee, and cursed is he who curses thee. And then in verse 18, Balaam says, Israel shall do valiantly. Well, thus, brethren, we should expect from this all these blessings we should expect the heraldic national coats of arms of Britain and America to include these symbols, as I've just told you. Now, the British coat of arms depicts the lion and the unicorn, the young lions and the harp of David, and also the scarlet thread of Zara, as well as the motto Du Mondroit, or God and my birthright. God and my right. That's on their coat of arms. You just Google it out. We just have, we, we have all this information, brethren, accessible to us at the fingertips, as I always, always say. So all that you need to do is just Google out British coat of arms, and there it is. Now, the American Great Seal of the United States, I'm sure that many of you in America may be acquainted with, with its elements. Well, that great American Great Seal depicts an eagle holding a fruitful olive branch and arrows in its talon behind a shield. And you'll find all those elements in Deuteronomy 33, verse 29, in Psalm 5, verse 12, Psalm 91, verse 4. Remember, Psalm 91 is actually the psalm about the place of safety. And in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. And also, what do we find yet on the American Great Seal? There is a pillar of cloud. I'm sure you know about the pillar of cloud that followed the Israelites, Exodus 13, 
21, Exodus 14, 20, Numbers 9, 17, Job 9, 7, Psalm 105, 39. We have the, we have the pillar of cloud surrounding a radiating glory. Glory of God, Exodus 13, 21, Luke 2, 9, Psalm 63, verse 2. Shining from 13 stars in a star of David. This star of David under quotation mark because we don't really know whether they're a star of David. But anyway, shining from 13 stars in a star of David configuration, a hexagram. And each of the 13 stars represents one of the tribes of Israel, which you'll find in Genesis 37, verse 5, 3, 11. And the motto, motos is, and the motto is, E pluribus unim. E pluribus unim, which is actually out of many, one. Out of many, one. As I told you, brethren, Manasseh, the tribe of Manasseh, just like the rest of Israel, fulfilling prophecy of Amos 9 9, was sifted into all the nations. As soon as America became independent, many immigrants started to flood into America. And, you know, regardless of their supposed ethnic origin, they certainly were also physical descendants of Manasseh. So, e pluribus unim, out of many one. You'll find that in Genesis 37, verse 5 through 11, out of many tribes, many members, there is one nation. 40, Genesis 48, verse 19, Hebrews 11, 12. What about flags? Well, Britain has the Union Jack, or the Union of Jacob, with a cross to indicate Jacob's crossed hands. Because when he was passing his blessing to his grandchildren, Ephraim and Manasseh, he crossed his hands. Genesis 48, 14. And America also has all the glory, since truly Christ is our ensign. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10, verse 12. Isaiah 11, 3, uh, sorry, 18, 3. Isaiah 31, 9. And Britain's John Bull stands for the bullock of Ephraim. Heraldry, brethren, if nothing else, does prove very well who are modern-day British and Americans. And for all of us who are in the Church of God, we do need to understand that, yes, we probably have some Israelitish origin. And if not, it doesn't really matter, because the moment we turn to the God of Israel, that moment we become spirit-led Israelites. We become God's people, full, you know, full-fledged Israelites. Now, what else do we have on the Great American Seal? What else do we have in the Hellary? Novus Ordo Seclorum means a new order is born. When was it born? Well, it was born in, in 1776. Why was it born in 1776? Well, 745 before Christ, when the uh, gradual decadence and the fall of the Israelitish kingdom in the promised land began 745 before Christ plus 2520 years of their national punishment which was withholding the birthright from America so when you add 2520 years to 745 before Christ you come to 1776 AD is there a chance do you think it's just a chance of course not Again, as I said, God's eyes are always upon his people, Israel. You know, and modern-day Israelites are also British and Americans. Yes, Americans may not care about God. They may just want God to mind his own business up there in heaven. But nevertheless, his eyes are there on Britain and America. Always and continually. Now, on the obverse side of America's seal are... Mark the number 13, brethren. Our thir 13 stars. Have you ever... Americans, have you ever considered that? Well, go ahead, Google out, find out your great American seal and prove it for yourselves. There are 13 stars on the obverse side of America's seal. There are 13 letters in the motto. <laughs> you think that's by a chance? Certainly not. There are 13 stripes in the shield. There are 13 leaves and 13 olives on the olive branch. There are 13 arrows. Thirteen, as I told you, intricately involved with America. Yes, it's the 13th tribe of Israel. Do you think this is all by a chance, brethren? Certainly not. On the reverse side of the seal, we find a pyramid also that is unfinished with, <laughs> surprise, surprise, 13 courses of masonry 
and the all-seeing eye as the capstone which is the chief cornerstone which the builders rejected i'm sure you know those scriptures in first peter chapter 2 verse 7 ephesians 2 20 and acts 4 and verse 11. the only type of building with just one chief cornerstone is a pyramid and the great pyramid of egypt never did have uh, its apex stone set it was israel's genius that built the great pyramid and set within it the mathematical confirmation of scriptural truth don't be surprised because you know israelites were in egypt for a long time and who was the prime minister of egypt it was joseph then what do you else do you find on american seal you find a strange expression aninuit coeptis which means what it means he has prospered our undertakings or he has prospered our beginnings and annuit coepsis how many letters are there it has 13 letters brethren now you tell me this is all by a chance there is no divine involvement in all of that oh certainly certainly not there is obviously divine involvement in what evolved of the once upon a time insignificant little nation of america it evolved to be one great nation under god the most powerful in all the world brethren this is not by chance it is because of abraham's obedience it is because his descendants in these last days are fulfilling the scriptures and the prophecies given to us as far back as genesis the very first book of the bible it is just amazing i tell you again how speaking from the standpoint of a historian people have overlooked the significance of the first five books of moses it is not only about the law of god which is there which is there indeed it's not only about the creation of the world which is recorded there it is the history the modern history of the world you know recorded there in a nutshell yes we don't have all the details about the first world war and second world war but we do have details about what that the arrows will be strong of ephraim and manasseh that you know they would defeat their enemies devour their enemies so we have basically in a nutshell the whole history of the world prophesied right there in the first five books of moses and no wonder that the pentateuch the first five books of moses brethren, are the basis of all the bible with its law, with its prophecy about the history, with its, record, uh, with, with its record about the creation of the world, with God displaying his mighty miracles, with God forming his own nation, Israel. And God has remained faithful to Israel and to all of his promises given to Israel. Israel was the one who has never been faithful to God. But that is going to change in the coming kingdom of God. And how amazing all of this is, brethren. Well, what do you think? What was the uh, well from which the Old Testament prophets drew their prophecies against, at that time, ancient house of Israel and ancient house of Judah? Well, they were drawing it from the Torah, from the first five books of Moses. Telling them, you're breaking the laws written here. And therefore, what is prophesied is the famine and the pestilence and the captivity is going to come upon you and since we have duality in prophecy again that is going to happen again to britain and america to modern ephraim and manasseh jesus christ confirms that in the new testament and he confirms that also in the book of revelation the fifth seal remember the fifth seal is about the great tribulation brethren the Bible is just a unified book from the from cover to cover, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's all one unit. And again, we will not understand that revelation, divine revelation to men, unless we understand the identity of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, look at some more. The Hebrew word berit. Berit or brit means covenant. It occurs over 100 times in the Old Testament, and it is always translated covenant. Ish is the hebrew word for man and hence british means covenant man also hebrew word ein means mean land and the uh hebrew sound ania means ships and therefore brethren britain 
is the land of the covenant and Britannia the ships of the covenant. Even their name testifies who they, of who they are. And yet, many British don't care about it. Many Americans don't care about their origin. They think history is irrelevant. Well, you should care about your origin. Because it does involve God. It does involve divine intervention in human affairs. God's eyes are still upon Israel. That's why he's going to make America great again. After the great tribulation and a great repentance of the remnant of America and Britain. Yes, America will be great again indeed, brethren. I know that. It's a great hope. It's a great, wonderful thing. All the 12 tribes of Israel will be also great, made great as well as America. How beautiful hope that we have. And something that, you know, in fact, as being part of the coming government of God, in the kingdom of God, will be part of all that great process. Why should we be ashamed of that? Why should we be ashamed of, you know, the identity of Israel? As some, many who still call themselves Church of God are now ashamed of, and they just try to basically rattle it off, you know, and, and, and distance themselves from the truth about the identity of Israel. We must never be ashamed of it, brethren. It's an integral part of God's plan for mankind. English is another combination of two Hebrew words. Engel means bull, bullock, bull, and ish means man. Now, Joseph means, I said to you, I'll mention to you what Joseph means. You'll find it in Genesis 30, verse 22 to 24, means may he add. That's what his mother said when he was born. May he add. And Ephraim means fruitful. Genesis 41 verse 52. May he add Joseph and fruitful. Manasseh. What does Manasseh mean? Genesis 41 51. It means forgetting because, you know, Joseph was trying to forget all the bad experiences he had. Forgetting. Well, that's what you people of Manasseh today are doing. You people of America. You're forgetting your great history. You're forgetting who you are. You're forgetting your God who gave you all those amazing blessings. But Oh, but I'm confident you will remember one of these days. In the Great Tribulation, many of you will wake up. Many of you will wake up, Americans, yes. And you will no longer be forgetting, but you'll be forced not to forget who you are and what you have done against your God. And how forgiving and great He is that He'll spare you from a total destruction. According to Deuteronomy 21.17, the firstborn received, brethren, a double portion of the inheritance. And Joseph is the firstborn, not Judah, but Joseph. So Ephraim and Manasseh were adopted by Jacob, who told Joseph, they are mine. He told them that in Genesis 48, verse 5. And each was given one of the portions of Joseph's double portion. And Ephraim is my firstborn, it says in Jeremiah 31, 9. And so Ephraim was given even more, you see. That's the explanation of the great material wealth of you people who live in the Commonwealth, British Commonwealth. I mean the white race Commonwealth, the part, that part of Commonwealth, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and, you know, Great Britain. Now, one of Ephraim's sons was also named Aaron, and he might have, you know, he may have migrated to Ireland before the Exodus, and he might have given his name to that land because Erin is a poetic name for Ireland even today, just to mention in a passing comment. But now Jacob, in Genesis 37 verse 3, he was, uh, Jacob made Joseph a coat of many colors. And today what do we see, brethren? We see the Scots. <laughs> they have these multicolored plaidies. The wool plaidies are also very popular in Canada. Now Manasseh has, was great because Manasseh's tribe had the largest land allotment of any tribe in the promised land. It was a section of both the east and the west side of the Jordan. Just as today, what do we have in the United States? Famously, as we know, the United States has the largest area of rich, fertile, mineral, saturated land in the world, divided among the southerners and northerners. Oh no, it's not by a chance. If you thought America is divided on the south and north, north and south, just by a chance, no, it is not. It is all part of the right plan. But Ephraim, Ephraim, his younger brother, who became the first and, and stronger, took the lead in Israel. Took the lead. And then the entire northern kingdom of Israel was often called by that name alone in letter prophecies. So if you read Hosea 11 verse 3, Hosea 12 verse 1, 
If you read Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 9 and Jeremiah 31 verse 20, when you find Ephraim, brethren, when it says Ephraim, it means the ten northern tribes of Israel. And therefore, you know, Ephraim became a, you know, they all became a great nation. Genesis 12, 2, called Great Britain. But the British Empire, as I said, is the largest empire the world has ever known and has a larger population than the United States. But they were to separate later into two separate nations. Now, when I said the Ephraim took the lead in Israel, you should not be surprised because there are various people who are of the tribe of Ephraim, the sons of Ephraim, like Joshua. He was the one who led Israelites into the promised land. Deborah, the brave prophetess. Samuel was Ephraim of the tribe of Ephraim and also the first king of the uh, separated king of the north, uh, northern tribes of Israel, Jeroboam. Now Ephraim and Manasseh, along with eight other tribes of Israel, they separated from Judah and Benjamin in the time of Rehoboam. And in 1 Kings 12, you'll find that it was a tax revolt. But then in 745 before Christ, that was the beginning, the starting point of the gradual fall of the northern ten tribes kingdom, of which Ephraim was the leader. So in 745 before Christ, Tiglath Pileser, He's also called, called Pool in the Bible, in two scriptures, 2 Kings 15, 19 and 1 Chronicles 5, 26. So he was the king of Assyria. He began the first invasion against Israel in the reign of Menachem. The reign of Menachem, 2 Kings chapter 15. Now only the northern outskirts of Israel's land were invaded. No territory was conquered and no prisoners were taken. Why? Well, because Menachem, as it's written in the Bible also, it's recorded, he bought off this Assyrian king with a thousand talents of silver. But you know, this first invasion, brethren, became basically the first starting point of destruction of the ancient kingdom of Israel, of which Ephraim was the head. Now, also we need to always add one year difference in dating the various historical records. For example, Putnam's Dictionary of Events, he says that 745, accession of Tiglath Pileser, third of Assyria, who wage, wages war against Chaldea, Syria, and the Kingdom of Israel. But there are also others like Langers, he says the same uh, ruler of Assyria forced Menachem and Pekehiah to pay tribute. And there is always one year of difference, might be in dating, because you know it can be accounted for in different ways of reckoning you know, fall to fall or spring to spring year. And we see in 2 Kings 15 verse 29 that this ruler of Israel, uh, ruler of Assyria carried them, Asher, Zebulun, Issachar and God captive to Assyria. Captive to Assyria. He carried them but not Manasseh. Manasseh still remained its, in its land. Then in 742 before Christ, the same ruler, Tiglath Pileser, began the second invasion against Israel in the reign of Pekka, King Pekka, 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 20. And the Assyrian king invaded the northern region of the land, coming down south to the level of the Sea of Galilee, where he turned eastwards and invaded the eastern portions of Israel, Transjordania, which reached, you know, southward nearly to the level of the Dead Sea. And the Bible tells us in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 26, that the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh were brought unto Hala and Haber and Hara and to the river Gosan unto this day. So that means, brethren, that they, they did not return. Unto this day, they did not return to, the, to their promised land after the 70 years of captivity of Judah. Well, why? Because First Chronicles was written after that event. Now, in these two invasions of Israel were fulfilled the words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 9, verse 1. At the first, he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, that was the first invasion, and afterwards he did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. So prophet Isaiah prophesied, you know, the fall of the house of Israel and the, this, he prophesied these two 
invasions. So half in the second invasion, half of the tribe of Manasseh was taken captive and never returned to its promised land. Manasseh will return, as well as the entire Israel, to its promised land in the second coming great exodus, brethren. If you haven't heard that sermon yet that I gave some time ago, please hear it because it is an important biblical truth. Because there are portions of the scriptures in the Old Testament that you will not be able to understand unless you understand that they refer to the coming second exodus of Israel. Again, Israel, not Judah, but Judah will be also in that exodus because Jewish people are scattered as well as Israelites. Now, from about 723 to 721 before Christ, another Assyrian king, Shalmaneser, whose commander-in-chief was Sargon, he besieged Samaria, which was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, ten tribes headed by Ephraim. He besieged Samaria three years in the reign of Hosea. It's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 17. And then in 2 Kings 17 verse 6, it says, In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hala and Habor. Habor probably is corruption of Heber by the river of Gosan. The Gosan River, brethren, flows into the Caspian Sea and in the cities of the Medes. Now, this invasion terminated exactly the kingdom of Israel as it was prophesied by the prophet Hosea. And 27,290 Israelites were led captive. But Sargon did not remove the entire nation of Israel. So it's recorded in the Bible that, you know, some portions remained. Now, in 677 before Christ, Esar Haddon, son of Senaherbi, invaded the remnant of Israel when they were ruled by an Assyrian governor as well as Judah. So the two of them were, uh, they were invaded and uh, replaced, he replaced them with Samaritans. So the ten tribes of Israel, the ten tribes were taken captive and Samaritans were in 6, 1677 before Christ, they were populated by in that land. That population of Samaritans and populated with 2 Kings 17 verse 24. Now this invasion, as I said, fulfilled Hosea chapter 1 verse 6, which said, I'll no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I'll utterly take them away. And as Isaiah 7 verse 8 states, Within three score and five years shall Ephraim, the ten tribes, be broken, that it be not a people. This was, brethren, uttered about 742 before Christ, marking or making 677 uh, before Christ. And 65, you know, 65 years later. Just as also Hosea prophesied in his book, chapter 1, verse 4. In any case, the prophecies were fulfilled and the northern tribe of Israel, Israel's northern tribes were taken away and their land was populated by other people, by the Gentiles. You might remember that when we read in Leviticus 26, I'll just remind you, verses 14 through 18, God warning to Israel. He said, But if you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul shall abhor my judgments, I also will do this unto you. I'll punish you seven times more for your sins. We did refer to that in one of our messages. I'll punish you seven times more for your sins. Verses 21, 24, 28. But after that time, brethren, they unconditionally apply because of Abraham's obedience. Now a time, that's the point, a time is a year of 360 days. That's what it says, time. That's how we computed those 2,520 years, you see. Because a time, again, a time is a year of 360 days. Why? Well, we know in Genesis 7:24. We read that the waters prevailed upon the earth and 150 days. And this period of time is said to be exactly five months. We see that in Genesis 7, 11 and Genesis 8, verse 3 and 4. So five months. And therefore, from that, we have just computed this. I've always been bad at mathematics. So <laughs> if I sound too confusing, Mind me not, I'll send you all these written notes so you can be comparing for yourself and studying them yourselves and you'll exactly come to the right conclusion. So, five, three, five thirty day months are precisely 150 days. And therefore, before the flood, the solar and lunar years 
were 360 days long each. And that is why a circle has 360 degrees. Also, if we compare Revelation 12.6 and Revelation 12.14, we find that a 1,203 score days are the same as a time and times and half a time, showing that 3 and a half times equal 1,260 year, uh, 60 days, that is. And thus, each time, each time, what is mentioned in the Bible, each time must be 360 days. Furthermore, we know that Revelation 13.5 speaks of 40 and 2 months, which also add up to 1,260 days or three and a half years if we use 30-day months. And indeed, Revelation 13.5 can be compared with Daniel's, Daniel 7.25, time and times and the dividing of time, since both verses seem to be describing the same event. Now also you might remember in Daniel's prophecy, in Daniel's book, there was this writing on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Ups, Ups, Har, Sin. It might have baffled you a little bit, but, you know, brethren, shekel, shekel is used as the national currency of Israel today. A shekel, according to Exodus 30, 30, 30 13, and Numbers 3, verse 47, a shekel is 20 geras. And geras are the least common multiple of menes. It's 1,000 geras each. Now, tekels or shekels are 20 geras each, and upharsins or peres are 500 geras each. You'll find that in Daniel 5, verse 25 through 28. Now, making 2,520 geras total from mene, mene, tekel, upharsin. And thus we know that the seven times equals 2,520 days. So you might have wondered, why do we have those 2,520 days? Well, here you have, I've given you several times various de definitions and explanations. Well, here is another one. So for 2,520 days, or 20 years that is, the birthright was withheld from the house of Israel. And then after the punishment of 2,520 days expired, because they were by that time kicked out of their promised land, they populated the new lands, and now God had to fulfill his promise to Abraham, and he did it. No longer is he obliged to be blessing American Britain. If you're wondering why those blessings are now being taken away, well, it is exactly because God has fulfilled them. And the sins of the people who inherited those blessings today are basically turning those blessings into a curse. Sadly, but that's what it is. Now also you probably know that there is a day, a day is a year in prophecy. There is that principle of the Bible. It's recorded in Numbers 14, verse 34, and also in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6. So instead of seven times being seven years of punishment, we have 2,520 years of punishment because seven times 360 equals 2,520. And 20. Also, in crossing from before Christ to uh, our Anno Domini, to our era, to our era dates, it is necessary to add a year to the figure since there is no year zero. Now, you may wonder why is all this important? Well, again, so that we will see how the divine hand of God has been involved in the formation of the American nations, brethren, and British nation as well. So, from 745 before Christ, the first invasion of Assyria in ancient Israel, we add 2,520 years to get 1775. If we add one because of no year zero, we get 1776, the very year the Declaration of Independence was signed. Americans no longer paid tribute. They had begun paying tribute exactly 2,520 years before they were paying tribute, as we read in the Bible, uh, as I mentioned uh, a minute ago, they were paying tribute to the Assyrians. Look at more, brethren. From 742 before Christ, we had 2,520 years getting 1780. Plus one is 1781. This was the year 
that the Articles of Confederation were ratified and adopted by the original 13 states as the first constitution of the United States. Are you dumbfounded by these facts? You should be. You should be because they reveal exactly who you are, Americans. And Americans were now united in a league. They were divided by Assyria exactly 2,520 years before. Also, Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown October 19, 1781, and the war rapidly came to a halt after this event. Let's see a bit of, from the British history. From 723 before Christ, we add 2,520 years to get... 1797 plus 1 is 1798 when the Irish rebellion occurred. Also from 721 before Christ when the kingdom of Assyria complete uh, kingdom of Assyria overtook completely the kingdom of Israel, we had 2520 years to get 1799 plus 1 is 1800. In this very year, October 1st, 1800 Spain gave France the Louisiana Territory. The United States, during the time of Thomas Jefferson, purchased it in 1803 from Napoleon. Well, brethren, Israel's land had been lost to Assyria exactly 2,520 years before. Just as Reuben anciently lost the birthright, so again in 1803, he undervalued it and Joseph got the birthright of rich land. This very year, 1800, was also when England, Scotland and Ireland united to become Great Britain. And these Ephraimites, because English are descendants of Ephraimites and Jews, had been divided in 721 before Christ because the Assyrians left the kingdom of Judah alone and only invaded the kingdom of Israel. And now they were united in their new land. How amazing. You tell me it's all by chance. Has nothing to do with God's intervention. Certainly not. Wake up British and Americans. Wake up to your identity. Wake up to who you are. Before it is too late. And it's already getting too late because your ally, your supposed ally Germany, is building the huge Neo-Roman Empire, the last revival of the Roman Empire in the world, which will this time, at this time, will succeed to conquer you because of your mounting sins. Yes, the Germans are given now the upper hand by God. It's also divine intervention because they are the rod of God's anger, Isaiah chapter 10. And therefore, this time, nobody can stand in their way. You can no longer give like you did to Hitler, you Anglo-Saxon people who gave Slavic lands and you tolerated Hitler's terror over the Slavic people. You gave them the Czech Republic, then you gave them Poland, then you, you let him invade Yugoslavia, the country of the South Slavs. No longer will you have Slavic people now to be, how shall we say, uh, a shield you know, because you thought if you would appease Hitler with giving them the Slavic lands and, you know, allowing him to invade Russia, that, you know, that, it will, that, that giving them, first of all, you thought if you give him Czech, you know, Czech, Czech land, that they will, he would be appeased and he would stop. Oh, no, he didn't. This time, there will be no Slavic people that you can use for your own gain, my dear British and Americans. This time, Germany is given upper hand by God, it's divine intervention, and Germany is going to get you, get you and destroy you completely. Why? Because of your horrible sins against your God of Israel, whom you despise. And you despise also your origin of who you are. How sad and how tragic. Instead of being feeling blessed for being God's people, instead of feeling uplifted by being, you know, chosen nation in a sense, you just despise, you just sneer at all that truth. How sad, how tragic. The Act of Union of Great Britain and Ireland occurred January 1st, 1801 to become the United Kingdom ruled over by a descendant of King David. And this is just one of the proofs that Scotland and Ireland have much of the Jewish origin, brethren. As I told to you when we spoke about the uh, Scottish and Irish and how the Jewish people migrated across the sea from Jutland, Jutland, 
of the north, the northern, north, most northern part of Denmark. Now, also from 677 before Christ, we had 2,520 years to get 1843 plus one is 1844. One year later, in 1845, the United States annexed. Texas Territory, which included large parts of New Mexico, Colorado, Kansas, and Oklahoma, as well as what is known as Texas today. Do you think it was all just happened just by haphazardly, by a chance? Of course not. In 1846, the Pacific Northwest was given to the U.S. by Great Britain via treaty. In 1848, the U.S. acquired California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and more from Mexico. And 1853, in 1853, U.S. bought a relatively small slice of land known as the Guts and Purchase. Just as 677 before Christ started a slow, snowballing, cumulative collapse of Israel, which took some time, even as late as 1867, Redding, Alaska was purchased from Russia. So the U.S. began a slow rise to great wealth that began in 1844. Well, of course, as you know, in you know, ancient times, it took years to besiege cities, transport armies and populations and plunder and remove beauty and take possessions of the land. Well, obviously, the great nation which God has blessed is the United States. No wonder, brethren. Britain is also called great and it is blessed. And these two peoples do possess or used to possess the gates of their enemies known as the Panama Canal, Bering Strait, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Philippines, Gibraltar, Suez Canal, Bosphorus, Dardanelles, English Channel, Cape of Good Hope, Aden, Malta, Hong Kong, Hyber Pass, Singapore, Falkland Islands and other islands. It was all fulfillment of God's prophecies, brethren. Israel was to have colonies in all parts of the world and dominion over vast territorial possessions. That's written in Deuteronomy 11, verse 23 to 25, Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, in Isaiah 54, verses 1 to 3, and Isaiah 58, verse 12. So yes, vast territorial possessions. Ephraim and Manasseh, especially Manasseh, according to Deuteronomy 33, 17, it says that God would unconditionally make thee high above all nations which he has made. That's in Deuteronomy 26, verse 16. He'll make them, you know, above all nations when? After 2,520 years because of Abraham's sake. And also Joseph's bow does abide in strength. We read in Genesis 49, verse 24. Israel was to be, brethren, militarily powerful after 2,520 years. We read about that in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. That was part of God's blessings and many scriptures reveal this. You know, in, you have it in Jeremiah 51, in Isaiah 41, 44, in Micah chapter 5. So many scriptures reveal that Israel was to be become militarily powerful. Sadly, people worship their military and they take now and, and rely on military for their security. Now in Leviticus 26, verse 8, I'll remind you, it says, Five of you shall chase an hundred. Well, interestingly enough, even that happened in the war that the state of Israel had with their neighbors. But however, this scripture had, has been fulfilled with the advent of, of course, mechanized warfare, machine guns, airplanes, submarines, atom bombs, missiles and the like. That's why America and Britain defeated their enemies in both world wars. In Micah 4 verse 7 says, I'll make her that was cast off a strong nation. And in Deuteronomy 28, it says, Thou shalt lend to many nations. Well, of course, what was the martial plan, but exactly the fulfillment of that prophecy. Now, Anglo-Saxon expansion took place in the exact order stated to Jacob. I told you, remember, Genesis 28, 14. West, westward, first from the promised land and the lands of their captivity across Europe to the British Isles, then on west to America in the 17th century, in the same century, India was acquired in the east. Canada, the northernmost part section of the British Empire, was taken from the French in the 18th century. Then in the 19th century, Britain colonized Australia, New Zealand and South Africa in the southern hemisphere. In the meantime, America were pushing west to the Pacific. So, the prophecy was exactly fulfilled. 
The United States is the nation and the British Commonwealth is the company of nations, brethren. Britain is Ephraim, English are Ephraim, and the United States is Manasseh, and that's the truth. And those who say otherwise are lying, brethren. They're lying and they do not understand the Bible prophecies. And these countries, United States and British Commonwealth, certainly have the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine, plus other peoples have served these nations and bowed down before them. Even their brethren, continental Europeans, have bowed down before them, before these white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And one of the examples that came to my mind is, for example, the Dutch people. The Dutch people are descendants of Zebulun, one of the tribes of Israel. They speak perfect English language. 80% of the Dutch nation speaks English language. Perfectly. With such, with, with no, in fact, with no accent at all. With many of them, if you didn't know they were Dutch, you wouldn't even know that, you know, that you would think that they were British or Americans. That's how, in a sense, that's a, 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 an example of how the brethren of the United States and Britain, of course, of Ephraim and Manasseh, continental Europeans have bowed down before them. Now, Israel was to be blind to her identity. It's prophesied. That's why many of your Americans and British are totally blind to who you are. In Deuteronomy 28, 28, in Isaiah chapter 1, the first four verses, in Isaiah 42, verse 19, Israel was also prophesied to worship false gods and idols, Deuteronomy 4, 28, Jeremiah 16, 3, 13. Israel was prophesied to have a new name. Your new name is Christians. Oh, we're Christians. And then, brethren, British Israelitism would come along and tell them they are the physical sons of God when they thought they were not God's people. Hosea chapter 1 verse 10, you will be no God's people anymore. In other words, British and Americans, they thought they were Gentiles. How tragic. They are not. And they would even become sons of the living God, Hosea 1 10, in the spiritual sense. They'll become, in the spiritual sense, Christians, you know, John 1 12, 1 John 3 1, Jeremiah 31 31. However, the new name Christians, well, your right name is Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim and Manasseh were to have a new language, Isaiah 21, verse 18. You lost your language. What was your original language, Britain and America? Well, you'll be surprised. No, it wasn't German. No, it was not Latin. Today, God speaks to you and to the rest of Israelites through the Bible, which is in English, not Hebrew. However, the two languages, Hebrew and English, are similar in many respects. For example, Kenneth Lyson, he finds 5,000 Hebrew roots in the English language, and other authorities put the figure still higher. William Tyndale, who translated the Bible into English, said, the English agrees 1,000 times more with the Hebrew than the Latin or the Greek. What a bad news for many anti-Semites, anti-Semites today in England and America. Yes, your language is actually is rooted in Hebrew. Why? Because you're of Hebrew origin. Not Jewish, I said Hebrew origin. Twelve tribes of Israel are from ever from the Hebrew. They're Hebrews. All the Jews are Hebrews, but not all Hebrews are Jews. The Welsh, for example, is so much like the Hebrew that the same syntax may be used for both. The Old Anglo, the Old Saxon language is said to be 80% Hebrew. And this is now important. One more thing. Let us trace the journey of Ephraim and Manasseh from the land of Assyria to their new homes. Now, here are some histor historical facts. I know some of you... Many of you may not love history because it's very complicated, but when you get down to it, brethren, it is so simple and it's so exciting. Here is your, here is your history in brief, Ephraim and Manasseh. When the Masageti moved to Europe, they became known by the names of the two, two main tribes in their nation, the Eglai and, and Angai. And the general name of Masageti was dropped. Eglai and Angai. The name Eglai, E G L I. AI is quite similar to the Hebrew word meaning heifer of the wild ox, ox antelope or unicorn, which was the heraldic symbol of Ephraim, brethren. The Angai, A-N-G-A-I, the Angai were subdivided into two sections, namely the Sarangai, north people, and the Darangai, south people. They lived near the Eglai on the Caspian Sea shore. 
because they were all, you know, when the Israelites were driven out, they were driven around the Caspian Sea and around the Black Sea. Now, according to Rolling, Rolling Stone, there is a people called by Herodotus the Egli, who appeared in Bactria. Now, Bactria is a province named from Becher. He was a son of Ephraim in Numbers 26, verse 35, and it was close to the Sakoi. Angli Sakoi, as these two tribes moved across Europe, their names were merged into the joint name Angles or Angles. That's how we called English people today in Serbian. Angles. Englishmen is called Angles in Serbian. Now the people of Menas, Manasseh were divided into two distinct sections, even when in Canaan, one east of the Jordan and one west. In Britain, they became the Norfolk and the Suffolk. And in America, they were the North and South. So it has always been this way, brethren. When the Angai or Manasseh section of the Angles came to England, they formed the Kingdom of East Anglia. And I've seen those people, you know, I've been in touch, I've been in touch with some of those people. They are very much different from typical English people. The Puritans who came to Plymouth Rock, they came from East Anglia. The East Anglian, Anglican or Anglian element was predominant also among the thousands of colonists who followed the pilgrims to New England. As Samuel Elliot Morrison of Harvard in his Builders of the Bay Colony says, quote, from East Anglia came the heaviest contingent for the planting of Massachusetts Bay, end of the quote. And also you have people in Great Britain today, the Manxmen, they may take their name, from the Isle of Man, Manasseh. I've been to the Isle of Man several times, beautiful island. Uh, and again, the mindset of those people quite, is quite different from, <laughs> from the English people across the, ch the channel, the Irish, across the Irish Sea. So again, Ephraim is England, brethren. Manasseh is the United States. Whoever says otherwise is lying and is speaking contrary to God's word. But this does not mean, again, that there are not other tribes present. I told you that many times. It is just that these elements dominate. So you have got, you've got other tribes, of course, in England, other tribes in America. But Ephraim and Manasseh dominate. In Britain, for instance, the Angles outnumber the Scots, Irish, Welsh and Manx combined. And finally, closing. Their father, Joseph, the father of Ephraim and Manasseh, he refused to commit adultery with Potiphar's wife in Egypt. Now, if you take this as types, as slaves in Egypt, Egypt is this world, but you know Egypt can be the modern Assyria, Germany. Americans and Britons will refuse to commit spiritual adultery with Potiphar's wife, the false harlot religion, the false religion of Europe. Its harlot is there, brethren, in Rome. The ecumenical harlot, as, it's, as, it's, as she's called in Revelation 17. So British and Americans will refuse to commit spiritual adultery. But will by then, you know, they be true to God. Finally. That's what God wants. That's why he wants, that's why he's sending the great tribulation. And then the Americans and British will be martyred. You know, many of them probably and they'll become resurrected at the start of the millennium. And they'll be worshipped as gods by the other tribes, just as Joseph's brothers bowed down to him when he was ruler in Egypt. you find that in Genesis 42, verse 6, Genesis 37, verse 8 and 9. And we can compare that with Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Brethren, great future awaits Britain and America. Once they realize their identity, once they turn to their God, once they leave false religion, to the, turn to their God and serve Him once they finally understand who they are. Yes, America will be great again in the great kingdom of God after the great repentance. And Great Britain will be great again again, indeed, truly great after great repentance and after the great tribulation and all the remnant of Israel, the remnant also of America and Britain, will be all made great in the coming great and wonderful kingdom of God.